Before we begin, just wanted to give you guys a couple notes just to, I've muted everyone now, so just to remember to keep you guys muted, because um, if not, the background will affect our audio. And um, everyone, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat, chat box at any time, and I'll be asking, I'll be saying the questions out loud to Vivian throughout the, throughout our studio visit. And lastly, the recording will be shared on our YouTube channel in a day or two. So if you want to revisit the footage, uh, just please log on to our, our YouTube channel and you'll be able to find all this chat and all of our previous chats on there. Yeah, so without further ado, this is Vivian Ho and she is a Hong Kong artist <laughs> that's here to talk to us today about her work. So yay, welcome Vivian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> happy meet often with Autumn Festival, I guess. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Vivian. Uh, welcome to my studio visit. I'm not, a, like apparently I'm not in my studio or in my bathroom because <laughs> the rain is too bad and I just decided to stay at home. Sorry about that, but then I mean, my studio is pretty much like a workspace and like a handout space. So there isn't much work in it for the moment. So I guess we're just gonna do this share screen thing. I'm gonna walk you through like, what I've been doing over the years and how they evolve. Um, so I'm a painter, I'm a trained painter, like a, like a traditionally trained painter, like oil painter. And some know me as an illustrator, but then today we're just gonna focus on the painting side of me, which is a lot darker <laughs> than the illustrational side of me. Um, so, okay, let me, let me start. So a, a little bit about myself for the background. Um, my professor was a, was also a traditionally trained oil painter. So she paints photorealistic paintings of scenery that do not exist. So I'm trained to paint, um, like really following and really being faithful to the, my references and looking at like colors and shapes um, really closely. So, and with that, I kind of bring it to other form of medium such as uh, watercolor, poster color, crayons, ink, whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, so my, my, range of work is pretty broad and you might not be able to tell from one style from the other but then the underlying concept is pretty much the same so okay let's go to like my first series like on the present it is called of delicacy and horror um i took this title from a english poem called the pikes and it was talking about like this meat-eating fish in the lake of the UK and where they like lurk underwater and they, they lurk underwater and then they're so beautiful, but then they eat people, like kind of things. Um, so I took this, I took this title and put it on this series and I need to like introduce a little bit about my series. So this is my first ever fully developed body of works. And I did it for my senior year thesis exhibition as, um, as an oil painting major apparently. Um, so for me, I'm primarily attracted to unconventional and quirky things with maybe a teen of dark humor in it. So when I think about it more, um, maybe it's related to my growing up experience as a tiny Chinese girl, but I don't want to dip it. I don't want to like go into that today. Um, so I did this series when I was in Connecticut in West University. So there is like, it's like a really small college town. There's no fresh market whatsoever nearby. And there's only like a really tiny supermarket where there's only like frozen meat and frozen drumstick and frozen fish fillets. And as you know, like when you go to a foreign country, you become where you're from. And I become a Hong Kong person. And for me, it took me a long while to figure out what it means by being a Hong Kong person. 
And after eating all this like frozen meat and frozen fish for like a long time, I realized my identity of being a Hong Kong person is that we get access to fresh food <laughs> and like real, real wet market and real like chopping animals up and getting the real freshness out of it. Um, so I went back to Hong Kong during breaks and went to wet markets and look at the fishes and talk to the, the market people. And I mean, like look at the fish whose heart is still beating when, this, when their bodies are chopped up. It was like so Sorry, Vivian, I think you, you got muted, muted there for a second. Maybe you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Just for the last second. You were Can talking you about me? the chopped up fish. Yeah, you were just at the chopped up fish. Yes, the <laughs> chopped up fish. And the um, really emotionally detached moment of Hong Kong people looking at all this like grotesque scene and thinking that, oh, this is awesome. This is like fresh food. This is like the best food material that you can make. Um, so it struck me that this is exactly what Hong Kong is about and that we can be quite detached when it comes to practical matter and it's not even a grotesque scene anymore, it's just like an amazing sight of high quality fresh food. So I decided to paint them in such a big scale, in such a big, this is, this is two meters big. So imagine I am, I'm like a small girl and this is like a lot larger than me. I need to like flip it upside down and stuff to in order to like reach to reach two spots that I can paint. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to I wanted to make blow them up into such a scale that force people to look at it until they can see the layers of colors and shapes in it that is no longer like a gross subject matter, but it's just like an orchestra of colors and and organic shapes. Um, so I think okay, let, let's let's go through this. Um, this is like two fish has mingled. I really love this because there's like a intestine coming off the mouth. Um, and this is like two fish hats off the wet market. Um, so this is another huge one. This is more than two meters long. Um, basically, this is just the innards of the fishes. And I try to make it into like a landscape painting. Because remember, I was trained as like a traditional oil painter. So oil painter they all do like still lives. And so I'm doing a still life for the intestines of the fish. Um, yeah, but then not a lot of white people know what it is because they've never seen like how it's done <laughs> of cleaning up the fishes. So this is like a um, bowl of fish hats. Um, I particularly like this piece because I think I was pretty loose on the strokes and I try to be like more painterly like you see the, the drips and stuff like they were there as by accident but I kind of wanted to keep them because yeah I mean like I don't I don't want I don't let's go forever debate over whether you should paint a photo reference and for me this is a photo reference, but I also want it to be more painterly and more expressive. Um, so I moved on to paint bladders. Um, that's like a really interesting story because like um, I have Indian schoolmates who were vegetarian the whole life. And when they saw these bladders, they didn't know what they are. And they asked if they are potatoes. I don't know why my mom is doing that. Okay. <laughs> and I do like a dip plate of these potato like bladders. And then I realized like when you look more and more into like 
the inside of the fishes, you take away what you're looking at and you're really just looking at like the shimmerous, the volume of it and the and the three Dness of it and the and the colors and everything. Like you see like I don't I don't need to use black at all. Like they're all colors. Um yeah, that's pretty much this this is my my university gallery, which is awesome because I realize like paintings against stone walls is actually the best because it enhanced their color. Sorry, I'm being really technical here. Um so I kind of moved away from this. So I after this I came back to Hong Kong. Um yeah, I first came back to Hong Kong and then I moved away from the fishes and I still stay at the wet market subject matter. But I was trying to like try to get like what what do I want to do now? Like now that now that the fishes is about my cultural identity and then now I'm back in Hong Kong and then I'm in my major culture scenario like I'm 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 in in my turf so what am I gonna do um so I met this artist called Sal Po and he's an amazing photographer in Hong Kong and he was running a really small art space let me show you this this is a this is in the middle of a bookstore, like a secondhand bookstore. And it's called 100 Feet Park. Um, so it's, it's really basically just 100 feet square big. And then I kind of took the chance and asked, oh, can I do an exhibition there? And then I eventually did it. Um, so the, exhibition is about it's called it's called animal sorry it's called animal farm based on a true story um so rather than rather than um ex how to say exploring what is beauty and what is grotesque i'm kind of exploring what is right and what is wrong and so from this, apparently, it is from like George Orwell's Animal Farm. And there's like a famous line saying, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. So um, I was trying to focus more on the fact that the animals part, um, the animal parts um, separated as it is in the market, like they're characterized, like pick hats are pick hats. And then, and then, the chickens, like they, the hats go grouped together, that kind of thing. And then the feet get grouped together. They don't, and then the ship, the ship hats get grouped together. Like they don't get to be even shown in like a whole animal form. Um, and there's something really interesting like about like these animals versus the fishes I did because these are mammals and they have expressions. They're almost they're almost a human like expressions. They're like human facial expressions. Um, so the series start with pig hats, and I'm trying out Chinese ink drawing in a watercolor painting style here. Um, but if you have read Animal Farm, you know like the pigs are the bosses, right? But even the bosses like the pigs. Um, are commoditized by us human and so we are ultimately the animals who are more equal than those out there which is ironic and real and what is right and what is wrong i don't know <laughs> i guess um like beauty and ugliness it is a matter of the eye of the beholder because i mean we look at them as food and then they look at themselves as lives i guess so okay, we can walk through this series like really quickly. So I did like um I did so this series I did an experimental approach on the medium. So this is Indian ink laid in layers on thick watercolor paper. So I guess like Chinese ink drawing is really about like this one goal, but then I I just want to do like layer by layer. 
And then this is oil painting also in large scale of like ch um, chicken heads. And this is just pencil drawing of uh, chicken feet. And this album, the lamp hat, which I really like because they really look like human and it's it's fun and it's gross, it's weird in a way that I just like it. Yeah. And this is the space. It's actually a pretty awesome space. Um small but then it, um sufficient. So yeah, this is how it was hung. Um, I have like a diplet of Chinese paintings of like cow hats and pig hats. Um, yeah, I think I'll repeat the picture. Oh, this is my friend eating a banana and looking at it. And yeah, this is my really early days of my art making journey. And then I kind of moved on from animals. I'm like, I've enough of animals. And I moved on to this series. It's called Can't Remember to Forget You. Um, so this title is from Momento, you know, like Christopher Nolan's Momento. There's like a line saying, Can't Remember to Forget You, and then it's stick in my mind. So eventually I make a series out of this line. Um, so I found like the wet market less intriguing to me culturally. And then so I moved on to another subject matter, which is emotions. So emotions such as like mm, frustration, a feeling of longing for someone, anger, jealousy, desire for procession. Um, it can be self-inflicting or you can express it onto other people. And for me, it's a form of violence to other people and to yourself. It is mildly painful, but really dramatic. It is a drama that makes us human beings, I guess. And it's a drama that at least make me feel alive because I'm a dramatic person, I guess. Um, and also it is like a form of micro violence that we can marginally tolerate. Um, and some might even enjoy it. And we all have our little kinks, like my little kink, like kinky stuff. And my little kink is that I love removing scarps from the wound when they're forming. So I keep removing, moving them, and it's just, it's painful. And but then it's just fun to do it. And then I don't know, it's weird. But I think everybody has this, and everybody have their own micro violence to themselves that they secretly have I guess it's painful but exciting um so this series is really about like those violence that we have on ourselves and on others which is caused by emotions um this one is actually it it, it looks a little bit exaggerated but these are actually hackies <laughs> um yeah like really serious hackies so this is like a romance related violence because i don't want to lose you and some people love biting their lips until they bleed um don't say we when you mean you and this is me this is basically me <laughs> i love like I just, I just don't, I just wouldn't let wound heal. Like, this is just me. And I would love to address one thing is that like it, for this series, I use like a different technique to do it. It's, it's also experimental. This is on paper with pastel. Pastel means chalk. So you can, you can see the pigment coming out and then flowing out to the corner and to the edge of the paper. It is because I use, so I will like, I would like draw a whole complete thing and then I will pull water over it and melt it until it's all ruined. And then I will use a hair dryer to dry it all over again. So the pigment will actually swim out following the water. 
and then I, I use a hair dryer to dry them to force them to stick onto the paper and then I will like draw them again and again maybe five times until I get the effect I wanted so it's pretty like mind fucking because I just keep doing the whole thing over and over again um, I guess because my philosophy is that like every time when I do something, I would do it better. So yeah, maybe it's the self-inflicting pain also. Um, so let's let's go keep on going. And this is a this is an emotion related to relationships. It's called you better go. It says you better go, but then the person just wouldn't let go, which is like a struggle of wait what is good for us that kind of thing um but then it happens so often i guess and then this is like a close-up of a bruise so why why bruises why um i guess is quite consistent with the fishes um that i see the color of the galaxy <laughs> in the bruises it's like a galaxy on the skin and i love how i see a bruise grows grow from the beginning to the end you know like how it becomes red and then it turns purple and then eventually becomes yellow it just for me is fascinating i sound like a serial killer right now but then i guess it's just the beauty of the nature um yeah so from this series all of this all of this uh captions is from the movie eternal sunshine on a spotless mind i'm really affected by pop culture so i always take things from songs and movies um tears can also be a violent act i'm getting all the way up in the sense anymore um finger biting i do that a lot i'm just too nervous about you right now um stay up and not taking off your corn until your your, your eye is going to bleed i don't understand what i'm looking at and this is a beaten up ankle I just need some space, maybe. Yeah, okay. So, um, so this is the only series that I try to be more personal and emotionally relating to myself. This is the only one and only attempt, actually, because I felt super vulnerable and naked after the series and all these people asking me, oh, do you get like validated and stuff? And I'm like, no, it's not about that. And then I just, I just felt kind of like too exposed. So later I kind of moved on from this subject matter again. Uh, I keep moving on from matters. Uh, I don't have this tab. Okay, let's do this. And then I started a series called We Could Start Over. So apparently We Could Start Over is from a famous line in a Wong Kar-wai movie. A Wong Kar-wai's movie, uh, Chen Guan Zha Si Happy Together. It was when Leslie Jun asked um, Tony Leung, Yeah, We Could Start Over. Um, so for me, it's really like starting over of like searching for a new subject matter pain. Um, but I know that even though my subject matters are shifting, the underlying concept of finding beauty in the ugly still stands. So in this case, I wanted to find romance in boredom um, in a city of Hong Kong, which is speaking to my own cultural identity, which I think is also important for me. Um, so I wanted to be, I wanted to be emotionally invested, but not as much as the previous series and not so in your face. So I, I include something that 
influences me a lot, which is pop culture. And for here, I picked Wong Kar Wai's movies because I was quite obsessed with them when I was in college, and it gave me like a new color palette to how I should see Hong Kong and a new way of storytelling of like the mundane stories of Hong Kong people, I guess. So in this series, okay, let me let me let me scroll you guys through this. In this series, um, every painting is paired with a movie caption from a Wong Kar Wai movie, and they are all long captions. Um, this is about expiry date, um, and then we I'm focusing on like one person at a time, and trying to kind of overlap the image with the romanticized version that I was thinking about, that I was trying to replace that boredom, that like ordinariness with fantastical stuff that I could think of that would romanticize the moment, but that at the same time with the palette of Wong Kar Wai movies. So I was really playing around with the whole movie concept. It's about a uh, bird without legs. Okay. This is actually a lady from from like an Apple Daily news report that she's homeless. It's just like a really sad story, but then I painted Sakura over her. Um, I don't think you'll fall in love with me. This is um, this is an old person bring a tree, just bring a tree and walking in a city and then I said um, this is my love ladder for you. Um, this is another sad story. This person lives in like a cage housing in Hong Kong, you know, those like bunk back but then with cages, with like fences. And then she was just like um, smoking in his bed, not moving, and then, but then I kind of like reimagine him as Leslie Jen and happy together, and then he he's under. No, I imagine him as Tony Learn, and then he was under the waterfall. And this is lonely Christmas. Um. And this this chair was famous in Wan Chai, but it's removed now, which is pretty really sad. Um, jellyfish coming out from umbrellas. And this kung fu person. Um, I guess from this point, I was really moving from like drawing realistic stuff to like a mixture of fantastical like a, with a narrative story kind of thing. And from this pastel, I moved on. Like I moved on and then I feel like, okay, I don't want to focus on drawing particular, like a certain person anymore. I guess I changed my mind really fast every time. And then I moved on to this series. Oh, it's, sleeping. it's called Forever is a Lie or Ace. So, okay, you can you can see like it is really different from the previous ones already. So move on to like a focus on the moments and space instead of the person, and I start having the person look away from the viewers, so they're all not looking at us. So I guess it's just like I thought it's easier for us to be in their shoes. Um, so it's less about the person, but more about like the whole moment. Um, so at this point, uh, I took on a commercial job that required me to produce an animation in Chinese painting style. So I started researching on Chinese paintings and they fascinated me so much. I guess, I mean, I didn't know how to appreciate them when I was a kid, but then now when I look more at Chinese paintings, the more I feel like they are so, they're so flat. They're so flat, but yet they are so dramatic. The really graphical and narrative and illustrational in a way, they are flat, but they're not. 
and they're like powerful strokes as well as really subtle shades. So they can give like a feeling of serenity, but really dramatic in tone and they can draw it in in the moment really powerfully. So I, I moved my interest suddenly to Chinese paintings and I was trying to see if I can do Chinese painting in a Western style. Um, so I was playing around with this theme, uh, this crossover thing. And you see how I was trying to like do like an ink drawing style of San Soi Wa in the, in the back. Um, but then I guess I did it in the Western way because I do like so many layers. This, this painting probably have maybe 20 layers in it. Because I'm using acrylic and they're really forgiving. So I keep like just adding in and adding in. Um, yeah, and then I went on and do more Chinese paintings. Oh, and this is like a really interesting one. And then this is actually not Chinese painting style. This is a Japanese painting style. Like a Fao Sai Kui style. Um, I really have fun with this one. This is like a bunch of people swimming across the Victoria Harbor. And then I wanted to create this like, angry sea kind of feeling. And then so I put in the Japanese style of painting sea because they're, apparently they're so good at painting sea. Uh, if you look at the Chinese paintings, not a lot of people are like, um, not a lot of Chinese paintings are about waves. They're all like flat water, ponds, rivers with a buffalo in it. But Japanese paintings really like fascinated me. You know, so, seawater. Um, I did like a quiet one. Um, and this caption is called 人生就是大流一場然後超然離去. This is a scene from Gam Yong. So this series, I'm still really attached to my pop culture kind of influence or heritage in me that I still caption that I should caption them with um, famous langs or sayings from from like our everyday life this is like go, go hai, zau, si, san, sin. and then this one is from Chan Zi one is called Zanda Gaba Liu Gabi Zanda Liu. It's an uncle trying out fake boobs, trying to trying to touch fake boobs, I guess. And I'm just matching her hat with all these Marquette red lamps. Uh, this is a this is an exhibition of A to Z, A to Z Gallery, uh, which is now in Paris. Uh, this is called Mao Zhao. Mao Zhao means drunk in Cantonese, and this is how it looks like in the exhibition space. And you can tell, like, I, I was actually using water, like, color pencil over it, too, because I was trying to co like, incorporate my drawing techniques into my painting. So the whole thing was just, I was just really trying to try out new things, I guess. Okay, so we're at the last series that I want to talk about. Uh, long one. This car, I don't understand your sorrow. I guess this is a really different one. Well, let me pull this. Uh, this is really different. Um, so if you remember from like the Bruce's series called I Can't Remember to Forget You, it was so personal and so emotional, right? But then for this, I was trying to be as detached as I can. Because I guess when I was creating the series, it was amidst a lot of like political events in Hong Kong. And I was feeling a little bit upset about all, of, all the political movements and what's happening in the city and everything. Um, this is the first solo I did outside of Hong Kong. 
also with A to Z Gallery in Paris. Um, I try to remove, you, you know, like how, how captions were such a big thing for me. Like I would like caption all of my paintings with like really long titles and stuff. But then this series, I only use odd numbers. They're all just numbered. They don't have proper names. Um, so the reason being, this is a series about loneliness. Not about boredom anymore, just loneliness. Just like how they feel that they're on their own the whole time, the kind of thing. Um, is I'm not even trying to have that person look away anymore. They're just really small figures that they don't matter. They just they're just someone in the scene that because I feel like I think at that moment when I was like creating this, I felt so small, and then I just felt like I don't have any power over controlling things anymore. Um, so this is a series about what is observed and what is normal, absurdity versus normality, I guess. And that our tolerance of absurdity is creating new norms, which is sad and dehumanizing at the same time. So the title, I don't understand your sorrow, um, kind of give the undertone of this whole series because like I was trying to address emotions previously, but now I'm like, I don't understand your sorrow. I, I know you have sorrow, but I don't understand it. I, and I refuse to kind of look into it. So it's like a really big change from how I embraced emotional bluntly previously to now that like, I don't even want to address these people actions anymore. Um, so we can like go through the series really quickly. Um, but the fact that I'm still using um, flowers and stuff, I think it means I'm still positive about the future that like, there's still something good ahead that is awaiting for us, the kind of thing. And then I moved away from the Chinese painting style, like the, the collaboration, and I make them into just marks. You see that these marks and colors and drips and shape that kind of, I think, help people to move the eyebrows around. And it can add like a dramatic feeling to it, I guess. Um, yeah, and see like how she's not she just moving away from us and all these people just like a bunch of cloud crowns that they're looking at a ufo but then they don't have much emotion moved by it they're just like yeah there and then they're holding onto umbrellas saying yeah the sun is bright and that's a ufo there um four guys talking about future but not really um uncles playing chess that actually is bomberman versus pikachu and it's just normal as that um this girl which i can totally fit myself in because she kind of looks like me that she's looking at this city and then this autumn leaves falling and it's kind of like my feeling of like oh my is everything collapsing that kind of feeling um this girl who's on the ferry that's like a killer whale right in front of her but then she was just listening to her woman um two guys hanging with sharks in the sky and they're not even talking to each other about it like nothing's happening. Um, this kid's on a train who's enjoying the views of gigantic flowers outside, but then one of the kids just passed out and she just doesn't care. Um, there's two aunties playing badminton, but then the ball is actually a grenade. And this is maybe the most hopeful painting in the whole series is because like these lanterns are like the fontine dan, like the, the wishy lanterns that you get in Taiwan, right? And like, I just, this, this is like my wishful painting, I guess. 
and this is how it how they look like in the space yeah so okay so this is pretty much what i want to show you guys today and I yeah have thanks. a lot <laughs> thanks for sharing all of that and showing us all of your work so I think we're going to start opening it up for more questions. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to type them into the chat box and I will read them out loud to Vivian. Um, maybe I'll start with a question. So it seems yeah. from the six or so series that you've shown us, you're always kind of moving on to different subject matter. Uh, you also start always using new techniques. Is it more, do you get tired of one technique or, or one specific sub subject matter and then you move on? Are you trying to find some, like your ultimate um, style or, yeah? Um, I became an oil painter only because my professor was an oil painter. And then I was not introduced to other kind of mediums. So I guess oil painting gave me like a basic knowledge of how painting and drawing works. But then I, I just don't want to constrain myself into like one way of art making or one way of one one kind of medium, and I just keep wanting to explore and know. Maybe there, there are more possibilities I can make out of, you know, new materials, and this is what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm settling on one thing yet. Okay, so kind of always exploring is what you you enjoy doing for now. Yeah, and I'm also doing a lot of computer graphics, so like I, I guess it, it affects me in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a bit about what you're working on now? If you're working on anything? Yeah, oh yeah, I'm working on a series that is not like seen by anyone, uh, which is about abandoned subject. Um, completely consumed and completely abandoned subjects, which is like chewing gums tea bags, tissue paper. And you know like when you, you when you chew a gum, you would just take the juice out of it and then you completely just like spill the whole thing out and then nothing is useless. And then you just tossed it. And you just consumed it and then you completely abandon it. And this is um, a subject matter that I'm exploring right now. Like what is useful and what is useless, the kind of thing. Do you usually think of uh, a subject matter first and work off of that? Or do you have kind of images that come to your head that you, that you um, I think is both. The reason why I painted the bruises is because I was or, like primarily drawn to the color of the bruises on skin. And why I choose like this chewing gum is because I'm, I'm, I'm primarily drawn to how they look when they stick onto something and you tear them out and they're like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like this, there's just so many micro moments in a really small, small object. And then I try to find the irony in things afterward because I'm more like a technical person. So for me, colors and shapes always come first. Okay. So Henry has a question. He asks, you talked about being more or less exposed or detached through the different series. How conscious was the decision to do this? Was this also a kind of experimentation of emotional technique? Mm, I guess it's because I was trained as a technical painter. As I told you, like my choice of a subject matter is a lot of the times over the colors and shapes and but then I mean for you to actually to actually produce good works you need to be more emotionally invested you need to get connected to the work you need to feel like it's your baby so I really had this moment that I really want them to be my baby. I want to be more emotionally related to my works. So that's why I did the bruises. And I, I suddenly felt like, and then after that, I felt like I was, I was so infested when I produced them. But then after that, when I had to showcase it to people, it's like a different 
kind of thing. I guess it's like a balance between making them and showcasing them. Yeah. I guess like if I want to do something that is so exposing, I probably would keep them to myself and not like put it up in an exhibition because exhibition for me has some purpose of like showing it to public, right? Yeah. So, so I guess you're you're saying like you you have no problem making works that are more personal. It's more the part where you're showing it to other people that makes you. Yeah, I'm, I can get really self conscious about that. Mm -hmm. So, so is that a huge consideration when you're making work? How other people will see it, or how other people will see you based on what you're making? I guess like, art has like two sides, right? One is um, expression of your emotions, like being expressive and connecting to yourself. And the other is a kind of like a means of communication, which is connecting to the public and connecting to viewers or the selective viewers that you want to collect with. So for me, exhibition is a means of like connecting with the people, with the viewers. So it's less personal. It's, it's really about communicating. Mm -hmm. Ying Siu has another question. They ask, when you talked about your philosophy, my internet, oh, sorry, my internet went down. Could you explain it again <laughs> and more? Thank you so much. Well, which philosophy? I guess your your philosophy about painting. I mean, because we when we talked before, you were also saying that kind of like through the different series, you're always trying to find your own philosophy and what you want to say. Uh, I think like in my in my works is really about like irony and contrast. Like what I can see is so contradicting, like beauty ugly, useful, useless, boredom, romance, normal absurdity is all like there's like a there's like a contrast and counterplay in all these elements that make it interesting. Or not like I can just I can just paint like a pair of scissors and it does not mean anything to me. It has to mean something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of a, a lot of people joined a bit late. So um, Richard also has another question. Uh, he says, I, "I missed the beginning part. I noticed you're draw you draw your ins inspiration from various sources such as pop culture, Chinese art, and Japanese painting. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the inspiration behind the body bruises, which you started talking about a little bit, which was that it um, it's kind of about the mini violences that we inflict on ourselves every day." I think the inspiration for that is really like my my relationships and my experience with like emotional violence, you know, like how you don't have to beat someone up to hurt someone. And then the bruises is like um, symbolism of like mild wound. Like you don't bleed from it. You're just bleeding from the inside mildly. But then you still get a pain out of it. And then the pain, the physical pain might be smaller than the emotional pain that you're experiencing. So like the bruise is only like a manifestation of, of the violence, but then it, it might be just a tip of the iceberg. You might be really hurt by somebody, but then you only have like a really small bruise that people can see, but inside you're like broken. Um, so I'm trying to see like emotion, physical pain, and mostly the color behind it. Like, how can it be so painful and so violent, so subtle, but then at the same time produce colors that is mimicking the galaxy? It's the purple, the green, the red, and the, and the yellow and orange. Seriously, they are galaxy, and it's like a pain galaxy is interesting to me. Vivian has another question. She asks, any particular female painters you like or admire? 
Uh, I really love um, Jenny Zaviu. <laughs> um, she is an artist that I've been admiring since uh, Wesleyan. So she, her subject matters, um, fat people press against glasses, um, people who are waiting their um, plastic surgery or seriously injured people at the ER or she males like like transgender but they still have the genitals like balls un uncut I guess <laughs> I don't know how to say it <laughs> but then but then her subject matters were like all those super controversial subject matters but they but then she painted in such a dramatic and powerful way that you can look away and just feel like this is so awesome and so majestic. And yet this subject matters are mostly people that you, or moments or, or like things that you would like look away normally. And then she just want to put it in her face. I think it, it affects me a lot. And then this is basically what I'm doing. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like the thing you're attracted to again is kind of the um, the contrast between the subject matter and the way that it's drawn. Yeah. Yeah. Henry has one more question. Going back to your first series, in 2020, the wet markets of Asia were presented to the West within the very different narrative of the coronavirus. How do you look back at the horror of the delicacy within this new frame, where in a sense, the slaughtered animals exact a revenge on humans? <laughs> wow. Um, I'm, I'm not like a scientist, but I believe that like we need cockroaches to survive. And there's a saying that if there's no more cockroaches, um, human will have been um, extended a long time ago because like they carry the virus, they carry the germs that um, enable like a balance in nature, so that we go we don't go like overpopulated and everything's under control. The kind of thing like cockroaches and rats. Um, I believe, I believe in karma. <laughs> I believe in cause and consequences. So. Yeah, maybe it can be possible. I mean, this, this, I believe in the counterbalance system of the nature. I have another question about you, your, your captions, your titles and captions. It seems like you put a lot of thought into them and even yeah, in, they're important. Yeah, the exhibition um, photos that you showed us is kind of the captions are really big in kind of hand handwriting. Uh, so how do you, do you come up with the paintings first and then think of captions to match them or already the captions are in your mind or the movies are in your mind and you want to make something that reflects them? Okay, to be honest, 50-50. Uh, but um, why the captions are so big is because when I was in Wesleyan, there was like a famous artist coming to give a talk. And then I, I really like his work. But I didn't like the way he talked. And I didn't like the way he named his pieces. They're all like untitled and unknown and untitled number one, untitled number 20. And then I thought like this piece or these pieces, they deserve a much better narrative. For example, like you make a wonderful movie put in a lot of money, investors, and a lot of CGI and stuff. And you call it untitled. It's just like a anti-climax of the whole thing. And then so I really, after that, I really decided that I need to put in a lot of thoughts in naming my works so that they get like a life, I guess. Yeah, and for like what's come first, um, it's really 50-50. But I can't your, tell you your, how I decide. <laughs> in your latest series, I don't understand your story. You said you've you only named it odd numbers. Yeah. So is that a very deliberate kind of? It is. It is, and then I count elements in the paintings to decide on the numbers. Like maybe they're like how many flowers in it, and then I like 
allocate a number to it, but then they're all odd numbers, which make me really sad. Yeah. When you, in, in the Leah series where you're mostly kind of drawing people, how do you, uh, how do you work? Do you usually take a lot of photos of people on the streets and work off of that? Or do you, it's kind of more from your memory or an impression that you have? Um, sadly, I'm not smart enough to just paint out of my imagination. I use a lot of references and I look at a lot of references and then usually for like a show of like maybe hand paintings, let's say, I maybe I, I will have looked at a thousand photos and decide on like what I want to do with them. And I alter them a lot and just to fit my purposes. Mm -hmm. But then once I have the reference, my mind will automatically just like, I have to follow the reference. It's just like a curse on me. I can't, I can't run away from it. So are these references, you mostly find them online or do you go out onto the streets and, and take photos yourself or? Uh, half and half. Um, so previously for the series, we could start over. I use a lot of photos from news articles. Um, news articles of like the homeless and stuff. Um, and later I partner with a street photographer called Nick Poon. Uh, he takes a lot of street snapshots and yeah, I, I mostly just like take photos from him. Cool. Well, we're almost at time. I know there's someone that just joined us now, but we're just about <laughs> to wrap up. So I guess I will, uh, for all those that joined late, um, you might not have heard that we have all of our studio visits on our YouTube channel. So this one will probably be posted in about two or three days. So for the parts that you've missed, you can definitely go back on and rewatch, re as well as any of our other studio visits that um, we have had previously. Uh, so thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you so much Vivian for talking about your work today. Thank you. Was, Don't touch it for a long Yeah, time. great. <laughs> yeah, and happy Mid-Autumn Festival to everyone. Uh, Henry says thank you for answering his questions. <laughs> um, yeah, and so everyone uh, stay tuned for our next studio visit and thanks for tuning in. Uh, have a good holiday everyone. Yeah, ciao. All right, bye. How do I end this? <laughs> I'll end it. Bye. <laughs>